that's what he was most interested in doing. And Dantavakra, of course, is another incarnation of Jai and Vijay, who was not very favorable towards Krishna either. And yet they got the opportunity to obtain both Sayuja and Swarupya, Mukti. So her devotees were struggling just to chant 16 rounds to come to the Brahman platform. And they did it by attacking Krishna. We're doing it by trying to please Krishna, but we're having a harder time than they had. So this is considered to be wonderful. Now, in order to understand this, it says, Tadvikanaratam <clears throat> Sadgurum Eva Vigachet. That we have to approach people who actually know what is the actual secret behind this particular events in order to understand them. Now, Prabhupada has given us his books, but as we can see, we can read the books. It doesn't necessarily mean that we go very deeply into the book just by reading it. Uh, we have to actually experience the book in order to understand it. Intellectual understanding is good, it's the beginning, but it's not well, actually, we're, our objective, our objective is experiential exp knowledge. That is experience knowledge. Mm -hmm. So how to get that knowledge, uh, that's what our whole philosophy is about. <coughs> how to actually experience Krishna consciousness. At the end of life, the only way we go back to Krishna is tattva daha. When we actually can, tat means that. Those who know English, tattva, tattva is very easy to understand as a Sanskrit word because all you do is have to add the H to the tat and you get that. So that means something which is, is experienced, that which you can actually point out, which is perceptible, perceivable. And tva means the category of things which are perceivable, not just theoretically, but practically. So we have to know Krishna by experience, not just by theory. So how to do that? Well, the first thing to do is to hear, and then we learn how to hear. So the first nine cantos of the Bhagavatam are to teach us how to hear correctly. Of course, most of us, we think we're actually hearing, but we don't really know what hearing really means. Because if we actually heard something, we'd realize it, experience it, at least on the spiritual platform. When we heard Krishna about Krishna, we'd actually be with Krishna. Not just thinking about Krishna, but Krishna would actually be there with us, or we'd be with Krishna. So that hearing takes some um, realization, and that realization is what we're hearing about, how to get the realization when we're hearing and we don't get the realization, and then we have to hear about how to get the realization. But in order to apply it to get that realization, the first thing we have to do be after hearing, the next thing we have to do is remember what we heard. Because we hear something and we can't remember it, then there's no opportunity to know how to apply it. So after hearing, we should remember. Now, of course, most of us are not Shruti Dars, so when we hear something, we quickly forget it. Therefore, we have these books, so we can hear them again and again and again, and then hopefully remember something. But of course, if we don't hear them again and again and again, we're not going to remember them. And if we don't remember them, then how is it possible we'll be able to apply them? Because we won't see what they're saying in order to apply them. Just like if you want to go from here, you want to drive to, say, Zagreb. Well, you may have a car, but you have to have a vision. You have to have eyes. So, at least now they don't have self-driving cars yet. But you have to have vision. And, you have to, and if you drive the car with vision, you'll eventually get there. And if you have no vision, you don't know where you're going, you're going to crash somewhere. So we're hearing and we're trying to remember, not just so we can repeat verses. 
so we can be show people how advanced we are by how many verses we can quote. No, we're, we're remembering these verses, we're remembering our philosophy, so we can see it. We can actually see it in this, where? In this world. For those who have internal vision, those whose hearts are purified sufficiently, then they, when they hear about Krishna, they can actually see Krishna, at least within their heart, at least create the form, Krishna will create some kind of form within our heart of the deities or the descriptions in the books which is also Krishna, an expansion of Krishna. But we also have to see Krishna in this world. Therefore, it is said that the first two cantos of Bhagavatam are most valuable for the conditioned soul because they teach us how to see this Krishna in this world. If we can't see Krishna in this world, then how are we going to see them, him in the spiritual world? We can't see him as he's right before us, how are we going to be able to see him in Goloka Vrindavan, which is unlimitedly further away? So after getting the vision, what do we do? We apply it, but apply it in what? What is our field to apply it? There's so many people have so many fields. There's the field of sports, there's the field of entertainment, there's the field of science, there's the field of so many different politics, there's so many different fields. Well, what is the devotee's field? If we want to be devotees, what is our field of activities? So our field of activities, for those who actually want to become devotees, well, there's two fields, generally speaking, for the aspiring devotees. There's a field of becoming a human being, was the first field. And that field is Varna and Ashram. <coughs> Varna and Ashram means to teach us how to control the senses, how to control the mind, so that we can actually come to the platform of becoming a human. Now, that, that's not me meant to insult people. If you tell people you're not a human being, they get very disturbed. You're just trying to insult me. Are you calling me an animal? Well, I don't know if you're on such an elevated platform yet. <laughs> Animals, they're engaged in eating, sleeping, mating, and defending, but they do it in a regulated way. You, sir, are not quite on that level yet. But if you follow the process, gradually, gradually, you'll come to that level, and you become qualified first to become on the same level as the animals, and then you can progress to become a human being. That's not what I made up. I'm not making it up. Thakur, he says that by birth, everyone is born Shudra. Everyone is in the bodily concept of life. And then by education, modern education, so-called education, one gradually becomes less than an animal. So to actually regulate the senses according to the laws of nature, and engage them in a meaningful activity or meaningful activities for ultimately sacrifice for Vishnu because people may think, oh, you have your sectarian philosophy or dar dogmatic philosophy, and you're talking about sacrifice for Vishnu, everyone has to sacrifice for Vishnu. Well, that's, that's your philosophy. I don't believe it, so it doesn't exist for me. Yes, it doesn't exist for you because you're an illusion. And it exists for us because we're not an illusion. So does that mean we're being proud by saying you're an illusion and we're not? No. By a little examination of the difference between knowledge and illusion, we can see you're in the bodily concept of life. You think you're changing when your body's changing, although you're always there. You're, not, you're never changing. Therefore, you're an illusion. You don't even know who you are. You think yourself to be something you're not, this ever-changing body, but that's not who you are. You're the conscious person within the body. What's changing is unconscious, and you're who's conscious and not changing. And the fact that this world is controlled 
by superior uh, is undeniable. Who can deny time? Anyone here is saying, oh, time doesn't exist. I don't believe in time. Time doesn't affect me. It may affect you, but it doesn't affect me. I'm not growing younger. I'm not growing older. Time doesn't affect me. No, time is affecting everyone. So everyone is under the influence of superior, of a superior. At least time we have to admit. Even if we don't see how time is regulating the whole universe, moving the planets exactly in their orbits, causing us to eat when we eat food to help it digest it, assimilate it, and eliminate the unwarranted parts. Even if we don't recognize the intelligence behind time, no one could deny the existence of time, that time is a superior force within this world, superior to anyone, superior to the material nature, and superior to the souls within the material nature, because we can't stop time. Therefore, no one can act, no sane person could deny their own existence and the existence of some kind of God, whoever you may think. God is someone above us, above everyone. Therefore, when we're talking about philosophy and our, it's not our philosophy, it is philosophy. <clears throat> it is science. Everything else is ignorance. And we're not being proud, we're just being honest, conscious. So one field of activity is to become a human being, regulate our senses according to the superior instructions. And then the next step, step is there's a field of activities for those who are actually devotees, and it's the field of activities of loving exchanges with Krishna, Krishna's representatives, and then ultimately under the guidance of Krishna and his, his topmost representatives with other devotees, with innocent people, and even with the atheists, the loving exchanges. On the higher platform, there's love. On the lower platform, there is sense gratification leading to diminishing of sense gratification by proper regulation and proper focus of consciousness upon superior things, ultimately Brahman. And then there is the beginning of love, the awakening of the field of love. So for all our philosophy that we're trying to learn, all the different aspects of trying to remember and visualize and see things properly, then we should see that our field of activities are loving exchanges with the devotees. If we don't see that, then we'll miss the whole point. We may win every argument. We may have all the scriptural knowledge. We may be the topmost, think ourselves the topmost follower of the bhakti yoga process. But if we're not in, engaged in loving exchanges with the devotees appropriately, then we miss the whole field of activities. And then we won't understand anything, ultimately. We won't get any real conclusion from the Bhagavatam or the Bhagavad Gita or the Chaitanya Charitamrita. We'll miss the whole point. It said in this age, by chanting Hare Krishna, we'll get prasad, we'll get something to eat. But that's not the whole benefit of chanting Hare Krishna in this age. And the idea is that by developing expertise and expert discrimination, or in other words, expert, expert discrimination, is seeing what level of devotional service devotees are on, and those who are superior to me, to learn from them how to come to at least their level of spiritual understanding and activity, and to see those who are on the same level, more or less, as me, is to cooperate with them under the guidance of the superior authorities. And to respect devotees who may not be so advanced, but at least they're doing something in devotional service. Concentrate more upon Krishna and service to Krishna, especially to help the other devotees and help the innocent in their quest to become Krishna conscious. And not to to waste our time, simply neglect those who are we have no influence over in helping them become Krishna conscious. 
So our only real business is to serve the devotees and serve the innocent and serve Krishna and serve the atheists by helping people become Krishna conscious. Then we'll actually make genuine progress because that's what Krishna wants to empower us for. That's how we become an instrument. The more one de develops expert discrimination and expertise in loving exchanges, then the more one is actually being empowered by Krishna. Krishna Shakti Vinanaya Tara Pavartana. That's the empowerment. Not simply singing better or cooking better or eating better. It's the loving exchanges, service better. Then one will develop uh, traction, one will develop, well, steadiness, one will develop taste, one will develop attraction, and one's actual feelings to Krishna, as we practice developing our love and service to Krishna and his devotees, and to the innocent, and even to the non-devotee, the atheist, then our, gradually our love of Krishna will see our sincerity, and he'll give us the intelligence to manifest our love. He'll reveal himself in such a way, he'll give us the intelligence, that our natural love for Krishna will be awakened. And then our real life will begin again, life of bhakti. So then we can actually understand what this Bhagavatam is talking about. Otherwise, we may read and we think, I understand it. I, I, I understand it. It's, it's like in the palm of my hand. Ask me any question, I got the answer. But actually, when we come to the stage of prema bhakti, then we'll begin to understand what the Bhagavatam is about. I think it was Raghunath Bhatt Goswami. He'd read the Bhagavatam, and the tears from his eyes were washing away the the Bhagavatam. So that when I think it was uh, was it Naratam Das Thakur who was trying to get instructions from Jiva Goswami or someone, and they said, first bring a Bhagavatam. And he tried to get the Bhagavatam, but the only Bhagavatam it wasn't there anymore because the tears of the devotee had washed the Bhagavatam words away. So then that's really understanding the Bhagavatam. Then you can actually explain the Bhagavatam. We can actually explain it. What is this is all about? And if we miss that point, if we think we've understood Bhagavatam, we should understand something from it, but we should try to understand that we're, what field we're trying to apply it, what we're trying to do. Again, we're trying to first of all hear it and then remember it, then perceive it, and then apply it within the field of loving exchanges and then develop expertise and discrimination in our loving exchanges with Krishna, with Krishna's devotees, with the innocent and with the non-devotees so that gradually we, we become fully absorbed in Krishna consciousness and our natural feelings of love towards Krishna will awaken and then we can actually understand, then we'll actually be in what's called Krishna consciousness fully. And then we'll understand what the Bhagavatam is actually all about. We'll be able to expertly explain it or to others. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Any questions, comments? Yes. Recently I was asked, why not just respect all devotees? Why do I have to see, oh, he is uh, equal, he is lower. Why not treat everybody as very, very high and uh, respect everybody? What uh, uh, would you answer to such a question? Instead of seeing um, senior, equal, and maybe... Junior? Yeah, that's called impersonalism. And people are very, we're attracted to usually two things in the material world, materialism and impersonalism. Personalism means we don't want to use our, our intelligence very much, only up to a point of a Shuddha Buddha. And we want to see everything equal because we're too lazy to actually discriminate that someone else actually might be humbler than I am and more dedicated than I am. We want to put everyone on the same platform. So I don't have to actually think myself to be, I can think myself to be equal 
And because I'm the one who's seeing it, therefore I'm actually better than everyone. Because at least I'm seeing everyone equally. I'm equally minded. Unlike these other devotees who discriminate between Uttama Adhikaris and Madhyama Adhikaris and Kanista Adhikaris. So that's called imitation also. So that's the sure way of becoming degraded, is to imitate. Why? Because we're, we're obliged to become Krishna's instrument. Because everything belongs to Krishna, and we're obliged to, leave, to serve Krishna appropriately. Because even Krishna discriminates. When Krishna comes, he kills the demons, and he saves the devotees. And he tries to, for the innocent, try to establish religious principles. We don't hear Krishna killing devotees and, and protecting the demons and spreading irreligion. So even Krishna discriminates. So if we think we're above Krishna, Krishna is not so intelligent, we're more intelligent than we are, then we're simply, we're on the, we're actually imitating and by such imitation we'll simply become degraded. If we don't respect and take instructions for those who can actually train us. Instead, we take instructions for those who are actually going to degrade us. That's what we'll find, that's what we'll wind up being, is degraded. Anything else? Hare Krishna. Uh, you mentioned that devotees should also uh, serve the, the innocent. So can you tell us something more yeah, about Yes, it's called upeksha. We should neglect them. Because if we, try, we get intimately associated with them, we'll encourage them. So we, we would neglect them. We don't surf the web, which cuts off 99% of our association with the demons. And when we associate with people who are non-devotees, we associate with them as servants of our acharyas and disciples succession, and we serve them by either trying to, if we can, convince them to become Krishna conscious or just going away from them. We serve them by serving our predecessor acharyas appropriately. And if we can deal with them to help them, we'll simply cause them to commit offenses, we go away from them. That way we serve them. Anything else? Thank you very much. Grandara Shimad Bhagavatam Kijai. Shila Prabhupada Kijai. Gor Premanande Haribo.